Lockdowns don't work. The pandemic or the Wuhan flu originated from a lab, not a wet market. Inflation won't come yet because even though the table is set, no one is hungry. Gold could 10x inside the next four years and cash should be close to 30% of your portfolio. Wow, get ready for a discussion that contains all that and more. Now, Jim Rickards is my special guest today. Now, who is this guy, Jim Rickards? Well, he's an American lawyer. He's an economist. He's an investment banker, speaker, and media commentator. He's written numerous books, all that seem to eerily predict the immediate future. His latest book, The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World, is awesome. And that's why he's on the show today. 2020 confirmed what I've been sensing for a while now in relation to what's what I think is coming for the everyday investor. Change is coming, but it's a different type of change. It's transformation. The good news is that we can take a position in that transformation. There is something that we can do. Many investors will still follow the old rules, though, the old strategies and the old tools to build wealth. I myself believe that still this is likely the wisest thing to do, all things considered. But increasingly, I'm challenged to ask this question. Is this going to be a durable strategy for my timeline? With equity markets, even our entire monetary system globally, I think there's a growing chance that we're either in the eye of the storm or in the calm before the storm. Either way, things may soon get shaken. So perhaps investors do need to be reaching for new tools and new strategies so that we at least have a chance to get on the right side of what's coming. Two things before we start. You may not agree with everything that Jim states today, and that's actually a good thing. This is either because he's flat out wrong, or it's a truth that we're not yet seeing. Keep an open mind. Secondly, I'd like to thank our partner Hatch, who makes it easy to invest in U.S. markets from New Zealand. I use Hatch to gain some of my exposure to gold and mining stocks in particular, something you may be inspired to investigate further after today's show also. Now check out the link in the notes. If you sign up using that link and deposit $100 into a brand new Hatch account, they're going to top it up by $20. Pretty good deal. Now lastly, please be aware that nothing covered in today's episode should be considered investment advice. Hopefully it just provokes you to do a bit more research. So do your own research and listen to a broad range of opinions before acting on anything here. With that said, be sure to like and subscribe to the show and let's make a start on today's show. Jim Rickards. Jim, thank you very much for joining me today. Josh, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, you're joining me from your home, presumably in New Hampshire, the USA. Is that right? Yep. Portsmouth, cool. New Hampshire. Yep. Fantastic. Now, I'm here in little old New Zealand, tucked away in the middle of nowhere. And in New Zealand, um, we're, we're, like, we're going to have a discussion here just about you know modern monetary theory. We're going to talk about the price of gold. We're going to talk about the economic response to the health crisis that we're currently going through. But we're just to frame this discussion, we're sitting in a country that had a very strong health response very early on to this pandemic. And it appears for the most part that it may have worked and the economy has actually picked up. It's bounced back. We've seen that infamous V-shaped recovery. You're sitting in the US, you're not, you're not seeing it the same way. Do you wanna just start off by explaining to us just what's actually happening right there? Yeah, I think US to New Zealand is a little bit of an artificial comparison. So I am in the United States and I, I know what's going on here and I follow the situation in New Zealand. Uh, but here's the point, Darcy. Lockdowns don't work uh, to stop the spread of the virus. They are very good at destroying economies uh, and particularly hurting small business. The, the elites don't mind big business, uh, you know, an Amazon or an Apple computer don't really care. They're very unaffected by it. But small business, you know, restaurants, bars, boutiques, uh, s s small shops, nail salons are damaged by it. Uh, but uh, people look down their nose at small business and say, well, you're just a restaurant with 10, you know, wage staff and a bartender who cares. But uh, first of all, I care. Uh, and secondly, uh, the people who lost their jobs care. But more to the point, uh, the small, those small and medium sized businesses, now to speak about the United States, are 50 percent of all jobs and 45 percent of the economy. So you can't slam, lock down and effectively destroy small business without basically destroying half the economy, which, which we've done. Now, as far as New Zealand's experience is concerned, we have a lot more data than that. First of all, there is no United States for this purpose. We have 50 separate states under our federal system. There was never a national lockdown in the United States. Every governor and every mayor 
uh, particularly the governors, could make individual decisions. You had extreme lockdowns. Uh, we saw this in New York and California. You had, I'll call them moderate lockdowns, uh, uh, which we saw in Florida and some other states. And then you had at least one state, South Dakota, that had no lockdown at all. The governor said, look, wash your hands, wear a mask, social distancing, but we're going to leave it to you and trust the judgment of the people to do what makes sense. Um, around the world, uh, there, there was a study just recently released that looked at the 50 states, but also looked at 30 major economies around the world. Um, Korea had an extreme form of lockdown. Sweden had a moderate form of lockdown. Uh, Brazil initially had no lockdown. So, um, so and what they showed, and this is empirical data, this is not opinion, it's not political, it's just what the data shows. And you can see the studies are available online um, by one of them was a professor of medicine at Stanford University. These are not, you know, fringe commentators and non-experts. These are the top experts in the field. They know a lot more than our uh, Dr. Fauci. Um, what they show is that there is no correlation between the severity of the lockdown and the spread of the disease. Uh, Caseloads are about the same. Fatalities are about the same. Um, in other words, lockdowns do not stop the spread of the disease. They, they have no impact, no material impact on the spread of the disease. They're only good for destroying the economy. So New Zealand may have had a particular experience. Uh, it's good for New Zealand, uh, but um, it's not a model for the world. Uh, in fact, there is no model for the world when it comes to lockdowns because they don't work. Hmm. Awesome. Okay. Now I've just finished reading. I think I was explaining to you before you push record. I was listening to an audio book version of uh, your most recent book called Aftermath, which seems to eerily predict like in a very spooky way, eerily predict the events of 2020. I've just finished reading as of last night, your latest book, the new great depression winners and losers in a post pandemic world. You have a pretty good track record for calling things before they happen. That's, that's all I can say. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. But before we do, just, just to keep on going on this, um, the, the pandemic piece, you say that Wuhan flu originated from Wuhan, potentially from a laboratory, Correct. Uh, not from a wet market. Do you want to just explain to us a little bit more about that? Sure. It clearly came from Wuhan. Now, China is very actively using their what they call wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, setting out a lot of lies and propaganda right now. China pretty much lies about everything. So you have to just, it's not even a grain of salt. You have to set the filter everything through the prism of um, uh, official policy of lies. Uh, but China is saying things like, I mean, just today they said the United States should open Fort Detrick. The, Fort Detrick is a secure military base in the United States that does do biological research. Um, no one disputes that. But open Fort Detrick, let the WHO come in, see if the virus came from Fort Detrick. They're blaming uh, frozen food companies that it came from abroad on the wrappers of frozen food, et cetera. They keep coming up with new stories, what they call narratives. That's a generic word, but also the Chinese word, were translated into English. And um, I like to say, if you're telling the truth, you don't need a narrative. Uh, China keeps coming up with narratives because they're engaged in, in lies and propaganda. The evidence is clear that it started in Wuhan. Uh, it spread very quickly from there, and that's no surprise. Um, the Chinese, uh, certain individuals who point this out have died. Others have been have disappeared. They're presumably in prison, perhaps dead. Um, they, uh, articles have been suppressed. Uh, the Internet has been suppressed. Uh, China went into the wet market that they blame for this, which uh, the evidence is very thin that it could have come from there. But they went in and cleaned it out, scrubbed it from top to bottom with um, uh, with high potency disinfectant. Uh, so why would you do that? If you wanted you know, the, some reputable uh, medical organization, international inquiry to come in, why would you scrub all the evidence uh, away? Uh, what, what it does, it makes it impossible to prove one way or the other. Meanwhile, over the laboratory, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is China's number one biowarfare laboratory. The head of it is a major general in the People's Liberation Army. Um, it, whether uh, it... Uh, and they were and they were doing bioengineering on uh, back coronaviruses. These are things they've admitted that none of this is opinion, uh, certainly not making it up. Um, one of the good things about my book, the new uh, um, the new Great Depression, winners and losers in the post pandemic world. One of the good things about the book, there are 200 endnotes. So if I say something in the book and you want to dispute it, fine, go to the endnote, check out the evidence. Um, and and you know judge for yourself. But I have all the primary sources in there. But but here's the thing: they they admit the Wuhan um, Institute of Virology admits that they were doing back coronavirus experiments. They were doing bioengineering. It did start in Wuhan. Um, and given the uh, contagious effect of this virus, its ability to mutate, and we'll maybe get to the mutations later in the interview, um, 
they they flew in a major, as you say, a major general from Beijing to take over the laboratory. They banned everyone from talking about it. They won't let international inspectors in. Australia, I give Australia enormous credit. They had the uh, the bravery to actually stand up and call for an independent investigation. They didn't throw any accusations around, but they said, why can't we have an independent international investigation? They've been hammered with the most vicious kind of trade war tactics. Uh, Ch uh, China has stopped buying um, Australian wine, Australian coal, uh, massive amounts of Australian exports. Why would you do that if you didn't have something to hide? Now, there's, uh, every China lied. Um, these the, the WHO is basically a Chinese sock puppet. Uh, they're run by a, a Marxist, um, uh, you know, Tedros, who's not even a qualified position. Uh, China calls the shots. It's just a front organization. They initially said that there was no human to human transmission. That was a lie. They knew better, um, et cetera. So the, the whole trail going all the way back to late uh, 2019, certainly through early 2020, uh, is, is indicative of a country with something to hide, uh, squashing people, covering up articles, denying international investigations, coming up with counter narratives. So it very clearly, uh, there's more to it in the book and all the evidence is in the book. By the way, there's more evidence that has come out since I finished writing the book that is consistent with what I said in the book. So the evidence is overwhelming that it did come from the laboratory, which makes this at best a case of gross negligence by Japan and at worst a crime against humanity. So what we've seen here, though, is we've seen this this health crisis emerge. Um, you know, China was effectively exporting it throughout the world, and it seems to follow a, a bit of a progression when it hits that country, that host country, that virus causes a health crisis initially, which then spurs on an economic crisis. Then potentially it starts to morph into, I guess, a, a loss of trust in, in institutions. Is, is that correct? Like, do you, how do you see this kind of morphing as time goes on, especially when you put in second waves of mutated viruses? Right. That's, a, that's a very good description. I agree with it. Uh, I, would, I would look particularly at your phrase, the loss of trust. Uh, basically, people around the world have been lied to by many public officials in many countries. It's not just one set of lies. So I just described how China lied about the virus initially and lied about the potential source of the virus and has denied any opportunity to get to the bottom of it. In the United States, they said to us, don't wear masks. Uh, and then they said, oh, you should wear masks. Um, well, they lied the first time. You should wear a mask. Uh, or at least it's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a low cost option that perhaps does some good. Uh, but why did they say don't wear masks? Well, they didn't want Americans buying up all the masks, which were hard to get last spring because they wanted them available for medical personnel. That's a perfectly good reason. But why not tell the truth? Why not say, you know what, people, we don't have, a, we don't, we don't have enough masks. Um, we have frontline workers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, et cetera, basically risking their lives to help people who are dead and, and, and die, or help people dying of COVID. We want them to have the masks. You'll just have to waste. Wait, that would be an honest statement. That's, that was the case. And the American people would have borne with that. They would have said, yeah, that makes sense. Instead, we were lied to. They said, don't wear a mask. Um, and uh, then later they said, wear a mask. Um, so those kinds of lies erode public trust. So the problem is later on, you say something that may actually be correct, but no one believes you because uh, you've started down this path of lying. Um, flattening the curve was a lie. Um, they wanted to flatten the curve to reduce stress on the hospital system, but they sold it as, you know, here's one curve with a lot of death and here's another curve. It looks like a lot of a f a fewer deaths to so flatten the curve. So American people said, yeah, that makes sense. You know, they weren't necessarily experts in, in integral calculus. But uh, what they didn't tell you is that the lower curve was greatly elongated. You had fewer deaths at the peak, but it lasted for a much longer period of time. The number of deaths under both curves was about the same. Uh, so that's, a, and we're seeing that now. Right now, today, as we're speaking, the caseload in the United States is 10 times what it was last spring. Take as bad as it was last spring, and I lived through it, and we all did. Um, the caseload is 10 times worse. The fatality, the fatalities are are more than double. Uh, treatments look better, but the fatalities are still quite high. So if lockdowns work, why 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 is the caseload up by a factor of ten and the fatalities are double? Um, yeah. And if uh, uh, you know if flattening the curve is going to work, why are more people dying now than ever before? Sure. So it's been it's been one lie after another. So it's not surprising that trust is gone. Now, in in your book, you point to a lot of data, and like you said you're not just making stuff up. And this comes from a lot of research. You you do have a good, a really solid background if people want to research you. So what you're saying actually carries a lot of weight. 
so I want to get your opinion on this separation between the the real world Main Street and and Wall Street. You know, why are share markets so far apart from the economy, and where ultimately is that going to end up in? Sure, I, and I'll speak here. I will speak specifically about uh, the United States. I do follow international trends, but uh, the U.S. is you know the largest economy in the world, largest stock market, so probably most indicative of what's going on. The stock market has never been more detached from the real economy, ever. So, yes, stock markets are back at all time highs. They have re- more than recovered their losses from the uh, February to March uh, crash uh, at the time of the uh, when the pandemic panic first broke out. They recovered those losses and have gone on to new highs. So everyone says, well, it must be all good. And the economy's come back. And people look at their, we have our 401k accounts or like superannuation accounts or pension funds. Uh, and their values are back to where they were or higher than they were um, last January. So people say it's all good. It's not. Uh, here's the thing. The stock market is completely detached from reality, as I said. So let's just take the stock market. The S&P 500 is the most popular, widely followed uh, index. There are 500 stocks in it. Uh, but it's a cap weighted index. That means your influence as a stock, your influence on the index is uh, based on your market capitalization. So the bigger you are, the more Im- impact you have on the markets or in the index rather. So the, the S&P 500 is really the S&P 7. There are seven stocks and we know what they are. It's Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Netflix, Microsoft, and Tesla. Those seven stocks are 40% of the market capitalization of the S&P. They are also the stock's least affected by the pandemic. They're all digital. They're not bricks and mortar. They're technology. They're streaming. They're entertainment, et cetera, software. But they're, as I said, the least affected by the pandemic. In fact, for that matter, Amazon's doing better than ever because nobody wants to go out and shop in physical stores. So you have these seven stocks, 40% of the index. They go up. The index goes up. People buy more through index funds. They go up more because the managers have to buy those stocks. So you have this feedback loop where it just keeps going up and up. It's probably a bubble, but we don't really have to debate that right now because it has nothing to do with the real economy. Now, let's go over to the real economy. Um, As I mentioned, uh, uh, small and medium-sized businesses are 50% of all jobs in the U.S. and 45% of GDP. And I imagine those numbers are comparable in most other developed economies, not true in China, but it is is true in uh, in the United States and a lot of the OECD countries. So, um, but they're the, that's the group that's getting hammered by the lockdowns. Nobody shut down Amazon. Nobody shut down um, uh, Apple. Uh, nobody shut down Netflix, but they did shut down bars, restaurants, nail salons, dry cleaners, um, bodegas, uh, boutique uh, stores, uh, go up and down the main street of any town in America, small city or major city for that matter, but walk up Fifth Avenue in New York, you'll see, the stores shut down, boarded up, failed, filed for bankruptcy, equipment up for sale, fire sale prices. Even those are hanging on and not are not paying the rent. Uh, that's putting landlords in distress. They're going to default. That's going to cause a meltdown of bankruptcies in the commercial real estate market. So, so that's what's going on in the real economy. So, so here you have the perception, which is it's all good, and the reality, which is it's it, the economy is in awful shape. Uh, reality always wins. Reality always wins, but it can take a while. So that gap is going to close. The perception will gravitate to the reality. The reality is very poor. There will be a stock market crash, but not necessarily tomorrow. I wouldn't advise shorting the S&P 500. It's like, you know, standing in front of an 18 wheeler going 75 miles per hour, you'll get run over. But uh, but it, it's non-sustainable because the economy is in very bad shape. And, and I want to just keep on going with that discussion in a second. But firstly, modern monetary theory, you know, quantitative easing, pumping trillions of new currency into the system. I've always been taught that that inevitably leads to inflation. We've kind of seen inflation of a source, but it's an asset market. Um, can you just explain to me why more money printing doesn't necessarily, at least in the short term, create inflation? Sure. Let's let's just separate um the uh, the quantity theory of money, monetarism, Milton Friedman, which is what you're talking about with the money printing and the inflation, from modern monetary theory, which is um, not quite the same thing as sort of uh, you know, money printing on steroids. But let's start with quantity theory of money. It's, it's very simple uh, equation or identity. So money supply times velocity equals GDP. Simple as that. Now, velocity, what's velocity? What's the turnover of money? How quickly does the money turn over? So simple example. Uh, you know, I go out to dinner and I leave a tip for the waitress and the waitress takes the taxi home and she tips the taxi driver 
and the taxi driver takes the money and puts gas in his car. So in that example, my dollar had produced $3 of GDP. So there was the waitress tip, the um, taxi tip, and the gasoline. So um, so that has a velocity of three. My dollar supported $3 of goods and services. But what if I stay home and watch TV and don't spend any money? Then my money has velocity of zero because I didn't spend it. I didn't produce anything. I just watched TV. And I point out today, the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet, basic money supply is about $7.5 trillion. They printed uh, four, about $4 trillion of new money just in the past year. But the balance sheet is about $7.5 trillion. But I make the point, seven, you know, what is $7.5 trillion times zero? The answer is zero, meaning if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So money printing, money supply does not cause inflation. Um, I mean, where's, where's the inflation for the last 12 years? It doesn't exist. Money printing does not cause inflation. Velocity or turnover does. It's the lending and spending of the money that causes the inflation, if it happens at all. But right now, a velocity has um, been declining sharply, depending on which money supply you use. If you use M0, it's been declining since 1998. If you use M1, a uh, broader definition, it's been declining since 2007. Uh, but if you look at the numbers for 2020, it's a cliff dive. And I was just kind of going, going down, going down, going down, and then straight down uh, in the past year. So that's what's driving the economy. The, the money printing does no good. I mean, you can call it money printing, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate anything uh, unless until you get velocity. And velocity is not something central banks can control. Velocity is psychological. You have mm. to change people's behavior. You have to get me up off the couch and make me go out to the restaurant, in my example. Well, mm. right now, people, what are people being told? Restaurants mm. are closed, you're locked down, you're quarantined, stay home, don't go out. Well, that's not a great recipe for getting velocity going, which means you're not going to get the economy going. Mm. So in a sense, you, you kind of have this massive buffet table full of food, keeps on getting filled up with more and more food, really terrible food for you, by the way. It's kind of fake. Um, but if you're not hungry, you're not going to eat. Therefore, sure. you're not actually going to get any of the nourishment is that kind of what's happening right now is that we, we kind of have this this gun that's being loaded or this pump that's being primed. I guess, you know, what I'm wondering is what's going to be potentially the trigger that gets pulled that creates that velocity. Do you have an opinion on that? So what you have to do is change investor psychology. More money printing will do it. If people, you know, you said that the buffet is full and no one's eating. Well, that's because they're not even going out. They're, they're locked in their houses. Uh, but, you know, that's a perfectly a good metaphor. So the question is, how do you, by the way, everything I'm going to explain now, explain to your, to the viewers and the listeners, um, the Fed doesn't understand. The, the Fed doesn't understand monetary policy. That's the first problem. But um, you have to change the psychology. You have to get people in a mood, uh, in a frame where they want to spend money and the banks want to lend and they want to borrow and you kind of get the whole thing going again. Well, how do you do that when you've told everyone to stay home, locked down? Furthermore, deflation is a much greater danger than inflation. Mm. What, what is the central bank saying when interest rates are zero? They're saying that they're worried about deflation. Well, if you're worried about deflation, why should I buy anything? I'll just wait till the price comes down. In fact, savings, which is, you know, you get money, you make money. Well, I can spend it or I can save it. Well, saving is kind of the opposite of consumption. Consumption is where the velocity comes in. But if I save it, and by the way, savings rates in the U.S. are skyrocketing. People are saving the money. Um, then again, you're back to uh, back to zero velocity. So how do you change that? Uh, there's only one way to do it. Um, and I explained it in the conclusion of the book. It's, it was done twice in the 20th century. Central bankers don't know how to do it, or if they ever did, they, they, they lost that knowledge. Um, but the, you have to raise the dollar price of gold. And mm -hmm. it's not a gold bug argument. I mean, I own gold. I recommend gold for investors. But raising the dollar price of gold doesn't do anything to gold. But what it does do, it lowers the value of the dollar. When you say you raise the dollar price of gold, what you're really doing is devaluing the dollar. And the point of that is not to enrich gold holders, although it might do that. The point is to raise the price of everything else. Now, is the, a world of $5,000 gold is also a world of $400 oil, $100 silver, $20 wheat, etc. This is what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in 1933. He devalued uh, the in the in the greatest period of sustained deflation in U.S. history, from 1929 to 1933. FDR raised the price of gold by 75 percent. 
he raised it from $20 an ounce uh, to $35 an ounce. So you here you have the price of gold skyrocketing in a period of deflation. Well, why did Roosevelt do that? He didn't really, I mean, he, he confiscated all the gold for us, so he wasn't rewarding anyone. But the reason he did it, and it worked, by the way, was to change the psychology to get the price of, again, oil, corn, wheat, steel, all commodities, get the price of everything going up. And it worked. He broke, it worked. He broke the back of deflation. Um, and in the middle of the Great Depression, the first Great Depression, from 1929 to 1940, you had two technical recessions, one from 1929 to 1933, and the second one, thanks to the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve from 1937 to 1938. But the period 1934 to 1936 was a period of growth, high growth and stock markets went up, but that's because FDR stopped deflation and created inflation mm -hmm. by raising the price of gold. So that's the only way you can do it, but central banks don't understand what I just said. Yeah. And I just yeah. help them to do it. And that's that's so awesome because like a lot of a lot of books, a lot of commentators, much like yourself, will highlight the problem and kind of almost kind of shy back from giving the solution. But you've just said it. It's it's pretty simple. You you have to let your fall let your dollar fall relative to gold. That by default creates inflation because you you need more dollars to buy everything else, and right. inflation gets gets created. That that's right. it, pure and simple. Is it that is it right. that simple? Uh, yeah, it is. And by the way, it has to be gold. And you say, why can't you just devalue the dollar against the euro uh, or the Aussie dollar or New Zealand dollar or whatever? That mm. was the subject of my first book, Currency Wars, uh, which came out in 2011. Uh, that book is 10 years old. It's very fresh. You can read it today. You still mm -hmm. look, at the, the head, look at the headlines and see people talking about currency wars. But the point is, uh, if you devalue the dollar against the euro, for example, what are you doing to the euro? You're making it stronger. What does that do? It means Europe imports are deflation and their exports are less competitive and their economy suffers, which comes back to bite the United States because they can't buy our stuff. You know, those currency wars are uh, at best zero sum games, probably negative sum games, but leaving both sides where off. So currencies, I'm talking about major currencies, the dollar, the euro, Swiss franc, pound sterling, and New Zealand, Canada, Australia, all have very sound currencies. So put them in the mix. Their currency, uh, they might supply small relative to what I'm talking about, but Put them all in the mix. They're all good, solid, developed economy uh, currencies. Um, the, the point is they don't go to zero and they don't go to the moon. It's not a Apple stock could go to the moon uh, or Hertz uh, you know, can file for bankruptcy and go to zero. Currencies mm. don't go to zero and they don't go to the moon. What they do is they trade in a range like this. And, you know, when the, the, the key to trading currencies is understand the pivot points. Oh, here it's going to go like that or like that, et cetera. But they stay in a range. So devaluing one currency against the other doesn't do you any good. We're never going to live in a world where you know, people lose confidence in the dollar, but somehow they're all ra racing to buy euros. I mean, the euro and the dollar, Swiss francs, they're all going to move broadly together. There's only one form of money where everybody can devalue at the same time, and that's gold. Because mm -hmm. gold can't fight back. Gold's not fiat currency. It's not produced by a central bank. It just sits there. It's inert. It's a, an element, atomic number 79. So gold is the only benchmark against which everybody can develop, uh, can devalue at the same time. And that's what everybody needs to do right mm -hmm. now to get inflation, to get out of the liquidity trap that we described earlier. Mm, that's, that's a great explanation. So... I guess from the perspective of an everyday investor, what I'd like to maybe just quickly talk about here, how can we prepare? So if there is a, a great new depression coming up, the likes of which we haven't seen for almost 100 years, what should we be doing as everyday investors right now? Do you, do you have anything to say on that? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, I would say uh, it's not that the great new depression is coming up. We're in it. We're in the great, we're in the new uh, great depression right now. Uh, the effects will be intergenerational. Uh, there's good research saying that we should expect uh, behavioral f effects to last for 30 years, not 30 months, but 30 years. Again, there's a study of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco looking at 15 pandemics of 100,000 or more fatalities in the last 650 years. So my, my kind of timeline. Um, and that's that's the conclusion they reached. And I think that's, that's pretty accurate. Uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean you curl up in a ball and feel sorry for yourself. Now go back to uh, 1921 to 1923, the Weimar Republic uh, in Germany had that massive hyperinflation. That story is well, very well known. I'm sure our listeners uh, are familiar with it. But there was one individual, his name was Ugo Stinnes, and he went out and borrowed massively in the Reichsmarks, uh, and he turned around and bought hard assets. So he bought steel, coal, 
transportation assets, vessels, railroads, etc. When the hyperinflation hit, he paid off all his debts. Of course, they were sweeping the money down the sewers at that point. So I would say he paid it off pennies on the dollar, but it was a millionth of a penny on the dollar, whatever it was, he paid it off. But the point is, it, it cost nothing because the currency was worthless, but he kept the assets and he became the richest man in Germany. And his nickname in German, I don't, I don't speak German, but it was uh, Inflationskonig, which means the inflation king. So the point of the story is that even in, in the case of the worst hyperinflation of any developed economy in history, a particular individual, by pursuing the right strategy, became the richest man in Germany. So even in tough times, you can do very well. My recommendation would be I'd have a 10% allocation to gold, not 50%, not 100% by any means. That's That makes no sense. 10% is plenty. You'll have protection, uh, be able to participate in the upside there. I recommend a large percentage in cash, uh, perhaps as much as 30%. People mm. go, oh, well, cash has no yield. Why would I want cash? Uh, two things. Number one, we could be facing deflation. And in deflation, cash could be your best performing asset because the real value of money goes up. Even mm. though it has no yield, the real value goes up, number one. Number two, if you have cash, you have optionality, meaning um, as we get more visibility and more transparency, we can see the future a little bit better than we can now because I would be the first to admit or agree that there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, but if you put all your bets down now and ter you turn out to be wrong, uh, it can be very hard to get your money out. Or you, at a minimum, you have to cross the bid off, bid offer spread or pay transaction costs. Or if you put your, too much into private equity or real estate, it can be almost impossible to get the money out in certain conditions. Whereas if you have cash and you have better visibility, you can be the person who pivots. You may say, well, gee, I better buy more gold because here comes the inflation or uh, economy is recovering faster than we thought. So I'll buy some stocks, et cetera. You have those degrees of freedom if you have cash. Um, residential real estate is doing extremely well in certain locations. Uh, people are migrating from cities, probably not so much in, in New Zealand, but certainly in the United States, Canada and elsewhere, Australia, they're leaving the big cities, places like New York, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, and Chicago. And they're going to more attractive cities like Miami, Nashville, Austin, uh, Boise, Idaho, and Phoenix. So investing in commercial real estate, sorry, residential real estate, residential real estate in the go-to cities can be attractive. Commercial real estate, I wouldn't touch it. It hasn't hit bottom um, in the US, uh, but also elsewhere. I've heard the same thing. Uh, it's happening in Europe today from my friends in Switzerland. Um, the uh, No one's paying rent. Uh, there are rent moratoria. There are anti-eviction laws. Uh, and they say, well, that's financial relief for the tenants. Well, I suppose it is. But where does that leave the landlords? Most of the landlords are leveraged. They borrow money from the banks to buy the real mm -hmm. estate and they use rent to pay off the mortgage. Well, if they're not getting paid rent, they're going to default on the mortgage. Then the loss falls on the banks. But the banks have cleverly wrapped up the uh, mortgages in commercial mortgage-backed securities and sold them probably to you know, pension funds. your mm -hmm. listeners, right? So yeah. uh, so the point is, um, look, you know, look in, your, look in your, your funds and read the offering documents and talk to your broker and find out if you have any. But, but a lot of retail investors do. So, uh, so some of this stuff is a delayed effect. It's going to take a year to play out. But I would say a mixture of gold, cash, some residential real estate. You can have some equities. Just don't go too big in it. Um, natural resources um, and uh, you know some technology um, is a pretty oh sorry uh, treasury notes government bonds or New Zealand government notes um, I expect interest rates to fall a lot more which will produce large capital gains on the notes so some combination of a high grade government notes cash gold residential real estate um, and some equities keep away from commercial real estate and don't have too much in equities that would be a kind of a model portfolio. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, now, in terms of uh, gold in particular, uh, I just want to just hone in on that. On that, you you've made some some pretty um, I won't say they're outlandish, but fairly bullish uh, claims around where you see the price of gold going. Um, yeah. Can you just share that with us? Yeah, the price of gold should be in a range uh, ten thousand dollars to fifteen thousand dollars per ounce sometime in the next four years, four to five years at the outside, but but probably four years. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is the one I mentioned earlier, which is if you want to get out of deflation, you're going to have to raise the price of gold. Uh, and if you just take, uh, and this is all publicly available information, if you took money supply, so take China, European um, uh, Monetary Union, um, the United States, uh, UK, and Japan, 
um, and they're the you know the biggest uh, issuers of currency, the biggest central banks in the world. Add them up, you come out to about uh, thirty trillion dollars of uh, of M1, thirty trillion. Uh, if you assume you want forty percent gold backing, which is I think a conservative assumption. Uh, historically, gold standards have worked with twenty percent backing, but let's just assume forty percent to be on the safe side. So so you, if you want forty percent of thirty trillion. In gold, you need twelve trillion dollars worth of gold. Um, there are thirty-five thousand uh, uh, tons, thirty-five thousand metric tons of official gold. I'm not talking about private gold. Official gold owned by ministries of finance, treasuries, and uh, sovereign wealth funds. About thirty-five thousand metric tons. So just take the take the um, the twelve trillion target price, uh, uh, divide it um, by the um, uh, the 35,000 tons and you come to, uh, about $15,000 per ounce. So it's mathematically derived. It's not a number I made up. It's not a number I pulled out of the sky to be provocative. It's the actual implied non-deflationary price of gold. If you either have a gold standard or use gold as a reference to, uh, support your money supply. So gold will go there either way. It'll either go there through a chaotic, you know, kind of mess collapse of, the, of confidence in paper currencies, or, It'll get there in a reasoned way by design with the help of central banks and monetary authorities. But either way, that's where it goes because that's where where it has to go. There are other modes of analysis to get you to the same place. Now, people say, well, hold on. That seems like a pie in the sky number. It's, you know, six times or seven times where we are today. That'll never happen. What, what people don't understand, a lot of this is just fifth grade math. Um, if gold goes from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce, that's a 50% increase, 5 0. That's a big number. But if it goes from $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase because you're working off a much larger denominator. So the point is, it starts out slowly, but as it gathers momentum, those $1,000 increases become a smaller and smaller percentage move because the denominator is that much larger. So, mm -hmm. so when you go going from 10 to to 15,000 will happen a lot faster than going from five to 10 or two to five uh, for the reason I just mentioned. So all the more reason to get gold today so you can participate in that upside because it'll happen very quickly at the end. Yeah. Awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. As we finish up in, in your latest book, you, you make frequent reference to an HG Wells book, uh, the war of the worlds. So do you want to just um, cover off, you know, just what's the connection between, I guess, the economy today or our, the world that we're living in today and this 122-year-old piece of science fiction? Can you just explain that a little bit before we finish up? Sure. Uh, two things quickly. Number one, so the, so the Martians land on Earth. They come from Mars. It was like a big cannon and shot it. And they landed and they got out and they had these war machines they called a heat rays. Uh, and they, they were big tripods and the Martians were in them and they were firing these heat rays, killing everything in their path. The British military, you know, the military of 1896 were out there with cannons and, and it didn't do any good. They, they couldn't, the best military response um, could not stop the Martians. And they were on a rampage. They were killing everything in their sight, except occasionally they would snatch a human being with these kind of um, uh, tentacles and uh, suck their blood for nourishment. Um, but after you know, rampaging through London and killing quite a few people, they one day the the protagonist of the story wakes up and the Martians are dead. They're in their spaceships. They're not spaceships, but they're they're death. They're heat ray machines, but they're all dead. Or some are struggling, but they're all dying. What killed them? It wasn't the military. It wasn't armed force. It was bacteria. They did not have uh, immunity to bacteria that are quite common on Earth. So the first reason to talk about H.G. Wells is because when the coronavirus came along, it's still the case. We had no immunity to it. Now. Fortunately, vaccines have been developed, but the, the rollout is slow. But in the absence of a vaccine, humans have no immunity. So there is this parallel between, you know, what killed the Martians and what was killing us, uh, namely a germ, whether it's a virus or bacteria, to which we have no natural immunity. But H.G. Wells made another point, and this is also why I included it in the book. Uh, the word of the Martian invasion made it to London, but people in London didn't believe it. They were like, well, it's out, it was out in the countryside. It was some distance away. And they're like, yeah, it's just a bunch of farmers and they don't know what they're talking about or this is overreaction or panic, et cetera. In other words, there was a cognitive dissonance or denial on the part of Londoners as to what was going on in the countryside until it was too late, until the Martians actually arrived and started killing people in London. And that goes back to what I talked about earlier, the gap between perception and reality. 
The reality was the Martians were coming to kill you, but the perception was that it was a rumor or no big deal. Uh, we had the gap between reality and perception in the stock market. We had it at the initial stages of the coronavirus. You know, remember people saying, well, it's in China. It's their problem. They'll contain it. It won't come here. Well, it did come here. So I think the, 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 book, and the book also has lessons about um, over-reliance on technology. So uh, the book uh, speaks to uh, 19th century book, speaks to the 21st century loud and clear. Awesome. No, thanks very much. I really appreciate your time today, Jim. It's um, just been an honor to, to be able to speak to you. And thanks again for putting out that book. So The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World. Presumably that's available everywhere. You can get that on Amazon. You can get that on audiobooks as well. Yeah, uh, audiobook, uh, Kindle, uh, Amazon, and uh, she'll be in your bookstores also. Fantastic. All right. Thanks again, Jim. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Josie.